Hello everybody. So we're going to take uh, this whole education thing on the road. I know it's noisy here but I've got daylight and it's not as noisy as it is at home so I've had to come out and do this outside. So we're going to have a look at, uh, we're going to go over some stuff that we haven't covered. Uh, because of the um, final exam it could cover any of the things anywhere in the book or, or not in the book so we do need to cover all of the uh, background material so we're going to have a look at the um, three inch golden lilies we're going to go through that so i'll read it to you it's really windy here so bear with me um, three inch golden lilies page one two two one two three so we're gonna have a look at this today i'll read through it i'll give you a brief introduction and then um, i want you to do the questions in the book three inch golden lilies what do you think it'd be like to live in a different country in a different era <laughs> well i actually know what it would be like I, I feel like i come from the 80s where things were a lot better um, i've just finished a live stream this morning um, where we talked about different movies and we looked at a movie from uh, this year uh, last night in soho and um, planes trains and automobiles from the 80s uh, and such a huge difference between the two movies ridiculous amount of difference in the 80s um, planes trains and automobiles is a great christmas film it's not technically christmas it's thanksgiving but that's what the americans um, that, for them that's their main holiday um, and it's the same as christmas everybody goes home to their families so it's pretty much the same thing you get the same vibe from it um, it, was, it was by a director that was, it was low key, he wasn't special um, and it was a couple of comedians who were just really nice guys who came across as very interesting people and all it is is a story about a man who works a little bit too hard getting snowed in and just trying to get home to his family for, for Christmas. Um, such a simple story but it works brilliantly and by the end of it it's, uh, it's got emotional resonance, you care about the characters, uh, it's a real story that really matters and you feel like you know, you've, you haven't wasted two hours of your life. And the, uh, the other one we watched um, last night in Soho was um, a film that came out this year by um, Edgar Wright, thank you. Um, great director, a gifted guy. And he, uh, he took on a screenwriter who is woke and she completely crapped all over the film. She destroyed it. So what was left with this, this very nicely shot, uneven mess of a movie that was all politics and, and it made no sense it was self-defeating it was it was just a crap film and um, you know I feel like I come from the 80s where things actually worked uh, now you take a great director and you drag his work down until it becomes propaganda and the film is essentially meaningless no one cares I'm, I'm guessing none of you have heard of it because yeah, it's, it's really low rated um, it's just garbage and it's such a shame uh, and as for um, as for coming from a different country well from England, I live here, so things are quite different. But one of the one of the messages I would say that I agree with in the movie um, last night in Soho was it was set in the in modern day and the 60s, and the character keeps going backwards and forwards. And I think part of the message was that yeah, things have changed a lot, but really, in most ways, nothing's really changed. Uh, people are still people. What matters is still the same thing as, as what mattered to them in the in the past. Things don't really change. Essentially, what it is to be human is what it is. Um, and it doesn't, doesn't change that much for most people. It, it is what it is. So that's my take on it. A lot of people have asked me this. We do uh, interviews in grade 10. I know I didn't I work with you in grade 10, but I did with last year's groups. And we, you know, we do interviews. Um, we go through and I let you ask questions. And a couple of students wanted to interview me. And one of the questions they always asked is, what was it like to come here to this new culture? So it's not that big a shock. Once, once you understand what's important to humans, uh, people are just people. And it's, it's really not that complicated. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's any big culture shock in, in moving to another country. The biggest shock is in getting out of the habits that you've embedded and ingrained yourself in. That's what, uh, that's what most people can't do. They try and take all of the problems that made them leave their country with them when they go to another country. And we see this with immigrants. Um, living in London, we've got all these uh, Islamic um, immigrants wanting to change the country into Islam and forgetting that they fled Islamic countries for various reasons because they don't work and they've gone to a country for a better life and then they want to turn it back into the country they're running away from and we see this all the time you need to abandon what didn't work and move on to the future a lot of people can't do that they take their culture with them and unfortunately that ruins everything for everybody so let's have a look at these three inch golden lilies 
Uh, the following extract is from Wild Swans, The Daughters of China by Yung Chang. Uh, I probably won't get the names right. The book recounts the lives of three generations of women in one Chinese family through all the changes China went through from 1901 to 1978. Big changes. Uh, this extract introduces the author's great-grandparents and grandparents. Now this is a pretty grim uh, section. Um, now a lot has changed in China, but also a lot hasn't. Uh, China is one of the most oppressive countries in the world with the worst human rights records. And we're gonna look at that today. Um, in this story. Even though this story is not trying to condemn China in any way, it can't help but do so because what they're doing is just plainly wrong. Um, and you can change elements of it and you can certainly make a difference, but at its core you can tell that China hasn't really changed. Um, what's going on is still oppression, it's still abusive, and that hasn't changed. Um, noisy here. What annoys me is that the, uh, the world as we know it could be an absolute paradise, and it really should be. We're not overpopulated. If you took the entire population of the planet and put it in a, a single place, um, it would all fit with the population density of Manhattan Island. It would fit in one state in America. What's wrong is the way we're distributing things, the way the wealthy are sucking up all the, all the resources, and the rest of us have effectively nothing. Um, Something like 20 years ago, somebody worked out that if we took all the money in the world, put it in one big pot and then divided it out equally, everybody would get something like $150,000, $200,000. And that was years ago, and it's probably more like a million now. Um, that's, how, that's how unfair and unequitable everything is. Um, so, yeah, things need to change, but they don't. Um, and that's jarring. Um, so let's have a look at this extract. This is, um, you'll see what, well, I'll, I'll talk through it. Uh, my great-grandfather Yang Ru Shan was born in 1894 when the whole of China was ruled by an emperor who resided in Peking. The imperial family were Manchus who had conquered China in 1644 from Manchuria, which was their base. Uh, the Yangs were Han, ethnic Chinese, and adventured north of the Great Wall in search of opportunity. So again, we've got these people abandoning what they had before and taking their culture with them to try and change other people's cultures. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, my great-grandfather was the only son, which made him of supreme importance to the family. Only a son could perpetuate the family name. Without him, the family line would stop, which the Chinese amounted to the greatest possible betrayal of one's ancestors. And this is, of course, utterly stupid. If you take um, the Chinese, they believe that the, the family name follows the, um, the, the, the male uh, children, doesn't follow the females. The Jews are the opposite. It has to follow the, the patriarchal line. Uh, and this is purely a, an opinion because it makes no sense. Um, who cares? Who cares? <laughs> it doesn't make any difference. The family lines of most families don't deserve to carry on anyway. And there isn't a family on this planet who are so wonderful that they should be allowed to carry on uh, um, uninterrupted. We all make mistakes. Um, so I don't, I don't believe in any of this nonsense. And to treat uh, a man like he's of more value than a woman or vice versa. And we're seeing a lot of this in the media at the moment. <laughs> And it's, it's crazy, we see this woke nonsense where you've got these wokesters in America um, saying, uh, oh, female rights, females need to be empowered. It must be about empowering women so that we can sell our material to China where they unempower women. And it's all, it's all nonsense. It's all, uh, we call it wet rat politics. It's, it's a sack of wet rats, We're all crawling around in blind panic. And that's what their minds look like. It's just, it's just chaos. You know, we know this doesn't make any sense. Um, he was sent to a good school. The goal was for him to pass the examinations to become a Mandarin, an official, which was the aspiration of most Chinese males at the time. And now it gets really bad. Being an official brought power, and power brought money. It's all about the money, always about the money. Without power or money, no Chinese could feel safe from the depredations or officialdom of random violence. Um, so many of my students say, uh, oh, I want to be rich. And then you say to them, why? And they have no idea how to answer that question. Why do you want to be rich? Uh, don't know. Well then why? What's the point? What's the point of having money if the money doesn't support you in following your dreams? But a lot of people don't realize that. 
money is it, it isn't freedom um, without power violence there had been uh, never been a proper legal system justice was arbitrary I know how that feels and cruelty was both institutionalized and capricious an official with power was the law Becoming a Mandarin was the only way the child of a non-noble family could escape this cycle of injustice and fear. Now why don't all the people suffering this injustice just get together and destroy the system? And why don't we do that now? Why do we have so much corruption around the world and we don't have people get together and say, yep, we're not putting up with this anymore. <laughs> the, the very, very rich that control the entire world are not even half a percent anymore and everybody follows them around doing exactly what they're told to do. It makes no sense. Just beggar's belief. Um, Yang's father had decided that his son should not follow him into the family business of felt making and sacrificed himself and his family to pay for the son's education. The women took in sewing for local tailors and dressmakers toiling late into the night. To save money, they turned their oil lamps down to the absolute minimum, causing lasting damage to their eyes. The joints in their fingers became swollen from the long hours. <clears throat> so the entire family physically ruined themselves to get their one son into officialdom so that the family could do better. Um, that's how afraid they were of the system. This, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. To me anyway. Um, following the custom, my great grandfather was married young at 14 to a woman six years his senior. It was considered one of the duties of a wife to help bring up her husband. That's actually interesting. In a, in a patriarchal society, um, they look to an older woman to raise their husband. And in a culture like Judaism, uh, they try to marry much younger women to the point of, well, you look at what goes on in these secret islands and who runs those secret islands, so you can see that it's, it's going way, way, way further in the opposite direction. Um, however, I think when it comes to uh, partnerships, the partners need to be equal. And that's a hot take these days. But yeah, you need to be of equal status, equal interests, roughly the same age, roughly the same outlooks on life. Equality matters. Uh, a connection of um, similarity makes relationships work. Trust me on that one. Uh, following, my, uh, following the custom, my great-grandfather was married young. Right, we've done that. The story of his wife, uh, my great-grandmother, was typically uh, typical of millions of Chinese women of her time. She came from a family of tanners called Wu. Because her family was not an intellectual one, they did not hold any official posts, and because she was a girl, she was not given a name at all. Being a daughter, she was simply called Number Two Girl. Area 2. Um, those of you that have never seen Star Wars, uh, the original Star Wars was very good. Uh, there were elements of it that were really well written. Um, and it was told from the perspective of R2-D2. So in the very first movie, 1977, the first characters you see are the droids. There are two robots. Uh, one's gold, so he's important. Um, you know he's important because he's gold. He's shiny. And another one is um, just made of metal. He's white, he's blue, silver dome on the top. He looks like a dustbin. And that's not an accident. He looks like a dustbin. Oh dear. He's a mobile toolbox. Um, he, he can't speak. He just makes whirs and clicks. And that's how he communicates. Now the idea that uh, George Lucas had in writing this character was tell the, tell the story from the perspective of the lowest character. The lowest character. Um, who's so unimportant, he is not even given a voice. And that, narratively, is a very smart idea because it lets us see the entire universe from his very, very small and very biased perspective. He is looked down on by everybody. No one likes droids, nobody cares about droids. They all treat him like he's nothing. They don't even bother giving him a voice. No one cares what he has to say. They tell him what to do and he does it and that's the entire basis of his existence. And as the movie continues, we see that these two characters, uh, these droids, are effectively human. They, they have human emotions. They have um, at least equal intellectual capacity to a human being. Um, but we have no respect for them. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, they're not even, women are not even of value um, to the degree that they'd be given an individual name. So that means, can you imagine the mentality 
that would take three or four women in a family and say we don't need to give them a name because they're not important enough to have an identity. They're just a commodity to be used. This takes us back to the last page where we were talking about um, the women in the family were just, they were just forced to work hard to send the boy to school. Um, it makes no sense to us now, being able to look back on this. Um, it's incredible abuse. What bothers me is, in many ways, these things haven't changed. We've put a spin on them, but effectively they're the same thing. Her father died when she was an infant, when she was brought up by an uncle. One day, when she was six years old, the uncle dined with a friend whose wife was pregnant. Over dinner, the two men agreed that if the baby was a boy, he would be married to the six-year-old niece. Do you imagine having your whole life mapped out by idiots who were probably just drunk at the time before you're even born, having no say or no control over the entire future of your life? Crazy. Uh, the two young people never met before their wedding. In fact, falling in love was considered almost shameful, a family disgrace. Not because it was taboo, there was, after all, a venerable tradition of romantic love in China. This, this sounds... I hear this stuff a lot. I hear this nonsense a lot. You get this a lot in um, Islamic countries where the women say, I have to cover my entire face, but it's a good thing I choose to do it. So no, you don't. Um, if you take off that covering, um, the men will throw rocks at you until you are dead. You'll be stoned. Um, but they say, oh, well, it's cognitive dissonance. What happens is you have to justify it out. I have to do it or else I will die. So I have to convince myself that in some way I want to love this. And that's what we see here. Um, it's considered taboo and shameful to marry for love. But there was a venerable tradition of romantic love in China. Well, where's the tradition? Because if you do it, it's a family disgrace. So that's nonsense. We can't, you can't have it both ways. This is bad writing and it's bad, it's non-critical thinking. This is the lowest form of intellect, intellectual uh, expression. She's wrong because she just, she's trying to paint herself and her culture in the best possible light. That doesn't help us make decisions about what we believe. Now I'm reading this and I, I have to accept that she's making this up. I have to think she's not a reliable person. But because young people were not supposed to be exposed to situations where such a thing could happen, partly because it was immoral for them to meet, and partly because marriage was seen above all as a duty, an arrangement between two families. With luck, one could fall in love after getting married. Yeah, that never works. At 14, and having lived a very sheltered life, my great-grandfather was little more than a boy at the time of his marriage. My grandmother was born within a year of the wedding, on the fifth day of the fifth moon. In early summer 1909, she was in a better position than her mother, and she was actually given a name, Yu Fang. Yu, meaning Jade, uh, was the generation name given to all the offspring of the same generation, while Fang means fragrant flowers. Jade, smelly flower. Okay. So this, it paints a very grim picture. Um, so at the same time that this, uh, this writing is meant to say, um, you know, this was a, a, a traditional, culturally uh, enlightened time. Uh, we've also got this time where women aren't given names, where these people aren't given an education, where cruelty is everywhere, viciousness is everywhere, and no one stops it. Um, my grandmother was a beauty. She had an oval face. Oval faces are beautiful. <laughs> um, uh, with rosy cheeks and lustrous skin. Um, her long, shiny black hair was woven into a thick plait, reaching down to her waist. Um, she could be demure when the occasion demanded, which was most of the time, but underneath her composed exterior, she was busted, bursting sorry, with suppressed energy. So my grandmother was a beauty. We don't know if she was intelligent, we don't know if she was an individual, we don't know if she was in a free thinker, because those things aren't important. What was important is that she looked pretty. You can always tell. Things people mention first are the things they hold more important. She was petite, about five foot three inches, with a slender figure. Well, of course she's slender. I mean, people weren't able to eat food. Um, and sloping shoulders, which was considered the ideal. I'm sure I agree with that. I mean, okay, I can see other people might. Uh, sloping shoulders, it doesn't sound nice. Um, but her greatest assets were her bound feet, called in Chinese three-inch golden lilies, San Sun Jin Lian. Uh, this meant she walked like a tender young willow shoot in a spring breeze, as Chinese connoisseurs of women traditionally put it. Chinese connoisseurs of women. 
A connoisseur is someone who appreciates something fine art, something, uh, you can be a connoisseur of, of wine or food or poetry, not of women. Women aren't meant to be consumed. I don't even consider myself a connoisseur of coffee, <laughs> which I just insult with this coffee shop quite badly. Um, the sight of a woman teetering on bound feet induced a feeling of protectiveness in the onlooker because of her vulnerability. I think it would induce a feeling of uh, sickness in my stomach. Um, and then this is why. My grandmother's feet had been bound when she was two years old. Her mother, who herself had bound feet, first wound a piece of white cloth around 20 feet long around her feet, bending all the toes except the big one inwards and under the sole. She then placed a large stone on top to crush the arch. That's the bone at the top of your foot. My grandmother screamed in agony and begged her to stop. My mother had to stick a cloth into her mouth to gag her. My grandmother passed out repeatedly from the pain. I, I hope you're seeing this from my perspective. This is not right. Uh, this is crazy. Um, and unfortunately, we're still doing it. We're not, we're not doing it to people's feet anymore, but we're doing it to people's minds now. We're, we're crushing in intelligent discourse. Uh, look at social media. You, you either toe the line or you are, are banned. Um, I've been banned uh, three times from Facebook in a week because I posted things that didn't conform to left-wing agenda. And I was only posting what I would consider centrist, politically centrist material. That means um, common sense. I was saying, well, no, this, that is too extreme. And the other extreme is wrong too. But really, common sense is somewhere in the middle. And we got banned for that uh, because I was posting articles from my website that suggested, you know, these two extremes don't make a lot of sense. Maybe the truth is in the middle. And we got banned as being dissidents. Dissidents of what? It's nobody else's um, right to tell anybody else what to think. And all we're doing is showing that people are trying to tell you what to think. Um, so now, I think, I believe, that people who think differently are being treated the same way as these young girls were in having their feet crushed. You basically conform to a standard um, no matter what. Uh, you're conforming to this standard by having your toes and your feet broken. Now you have to conform to the standard by having your spirit broken, by moulding yourself into something that everybody else wants you to be. I think it's sickening. Back in the 80s it was still happening, but not to this degree. I mean, never to this degree. Um, last few years the world is has gone crazy crazy i'm seeing things happening that would have been uh, that would have been horrific and were described in in books a hundred years ago uh, and how you know it should have been a warning to humanity instead we're accepting it and it's it's very dangerous um, the process lasted several years. Even after the bones had been broken, the feet had to be bound day and night in thick cloth because the moment they were released, they would try to recover. For years, my grandmother lived in relentless, excruciating pain. When she pleaded with her mother to untie the bindings, her mother would weep and tell her that unbound feet would ruin her entire life. And how many times have we heard that? Do as we tell you, and if you don't, uh, it'll ruin your entire life. You have to crush your spirit and that she was doing it for her future happiness. In those days when a woman was married, the first thing the bridegroom's family did was to examine her feet. Uh, large feet, meaning normal feet, were considered to bring shame on the husband's household. Uh, the mother-in-law would lift the hem of the bride's long skirt, and if the feet were more than about four inches long, she would throw down the skirt in a demonstrative gesture of contempt and stalk off, leaving the bride to the critical gaze of the wedding guests. She would stare at her feet in, and insultingly mutter their disdain. Can you imagine that? Uh, you have to be broken. You have to be broken and fit into somebody else's idea of what is or isn't beautiful. Um, and that's exactly what we do today. To be accepted today, to um, look at script writers, they have to be political, they have to be left wing. Um, governments, they are demanding that everybody be left wing, everybody be socialist, and, and it's not a healthy way out. And there's no, there's no con uh, conversation. Um, my co-writer, Seth, he went to university and studied this. And he said they, they studied all the woke things. And we're going back 30 years. He said we, we studied all these woke uh, agenda things. But it was, it was a discussion. He said these things exist. This is what they believe. Um, and this is why they believe it. Uh, but it wasn't taught as fact. These things aren't facts. They're opinions. Uh, and it was taught that way. Um, now we're taught that uh, like being woke uh, is the only way and there, there is no alternative. 
sometimes a mother would uh, take pity on her daughter and remove the binding, excuse me, binding cloth. But when the child grew up, she had to endure the contempt of her husband's family and the disapproval of society. She would blame her mother for having been too weak. I think real strength comes from taking this and saying, no, this is not acceptable. Um, you've got to know where to draw the line. That's the problem. People don't draw the line. You have to be able to say, this is acceptable, this isn't. We don't cross that line. Um, and we need to stand by it. Um, okay, it's, it's okay to conform a little bit. Wearing a uniform, for instance, um, at school, I can see the point of that. I can see why that's actually a good idea. Um, in England, we wear uniforms. In America, they don't, uh, in most schools. Um, we end up getting a lot of fights. Um, it happened in England. We, we didn't have to wear uniforms in some schools, but we end up getting uh, competitions. Who's got the best clothes? Who can show the most money? And you end up with a, a system that doesn't work, where, where everybody fights. The kids, the kids are all picking on the poorer kids because they don't have as nice things. And we end up with uh, it's a situation that gets pretty ugly. So we cancelled it and we had uniforms. So now everybody has the same. There's no arguments. It took away one problem. It didn't take away the whole situation, but it did fix one small problem. However, it also made everybody conform and look the same. And this is exactly what we see in socialist countries. We take away any advantage that someone's got so that there's nothing to fight over. And it never works. It just means that nobody cares. Um, women could not remove the binding cloth even when they were adults as their feet would start growing again. The binding uh, could only be loosened temporarily at night in bed. Uh, when, they put, when they would put on soft sole shoes, men rarely saw naked bound feet, which were usually, here it comes, which were usually covered in rotting flesh and stank when the bindings were removed. As a child, I can remember my grandmother being in constant pain. Um, when she came home from shopping, the first thing she would do was soak her feet in a bowl of hot water, sighing with relief as she did so. Then she would set about cutting off pieces of dead skin. The pain came not only from the broken bones, but also from her toenails, which grew into the balls of her feet. In fact, my grandmother's feet were bound just at the moment when foot binding was disappearing for good. By the time my, her sister was born in 1917, the practice had virtually been abandoned, so she escaped the torment. And I think that the people who eventually said no, they're the people I respect. Because at some point, somebody said, I'm not doing this to my child. And somebody else went away and said, well, I'm gonna do it to my child. And then looked at their child and thought, you know what, maybe I'm not. And then it spreads and eventually we move on. And that's the same thing we're gonna see with woke. We're gonna see, um, people are gonna realize, hang on a minute, this is a straw man argument. It doesn't work, it doesn't make any sense. And eventually people are gonna wake up to it and abandon it. And it's gonna take one brave person to finally say, you know what, no, we're not doing this anymore. And it's starting to happen. We'll see. And it's the same thing with all these things through history. There's always some ridiculous movement where women or men, and it, and it is both. Don't, don't go thinking that women are targeted for this sort of crap. It's everybody. Um, eventually someone will snap out of it and we'll find a new way to abuse ourselves, as we always do. So questions one through 15, and uh, I want them submitted in the uh, attendance question so that I know that you did them. If you're in class, that's, uh, that's different. You can just do it in your books. All right, guys? Thanks very much, off you go. Yeah.